Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you join us from in the world. Welcome to Open Up, our live talk show. Um, I'm RJ Horner. I'm the host of Open Up, and I'm a volunteer here at Voice of Men 360. Voice of Men 360 is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2020 and is based in Toronto, Canada. Voice of Men 360 was born out of seeing a tremendous need and helping to step up and provide support and services for our men and boys to help them overcome their life challenges. We're part of International Men's Day, and International Men's Day has now been serving for over 21 years so far and is represented in 90-plus countries around the world joined together to do various activities. International Men's Day follows six pillars, which represent the overall well-being of boys and men. We follow in those same footsteps here. So why is Open Up so important? Because men are not willing to open up our hearts and share our matters with people. And when we do this, this can create undue physical and emotional challenges, which we hope to eliminate. And that's why we've created an open space to allow individuals to share their life journey through our platform. We aim to create awareness about the struggles and the life challenges that our men and boys have to go through. There are no limitations with gender, age, nationality, or ethnic groups. All walks of life are invited to participate in our programming. The goal is to make a positive impact on someone's life through this program. Open Up is recorded Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, where we bring in individuals to share their life journey with you. Before I do bring in our guests, I want to remind you that Voice of, or, yeah, Voice of Men 360's mission is always delivered with good faith towards peaceful harmony. The views and opinions expressed in today's episode are those of our speakers and do not represent Voice of Men 360. Our organization engages in discussion forums to offer inspiration and create awareness of the issues of men who wish to overcome their life challenges. We're not providing pet medical or therapeutic advice. Should you require that type of assistance, we recommend you contact a medical professional. If you have questions or concerns about today's episode or any three Voice of Men 360 content, please email us, info at voiceofmen360.org. My guest today is Melissa Marty. She's been writing since the age of five when she tried to write a story for her brother. But she ended. it was about, supposed to be about her nice being a nice sister, but it turned out that she was talking about being a mice sister. <laughs> um, this was her first re realization that you, we don't always measure up to our own expectations. Over the years, Melissa's learned to turn life trials and tragedies into triumphs and testimonies. She regularly shares her insights and her passion for life on her social media blog and her podcast, Come Out of Your Shell. She encourages root readers from all over the world along their life journey to love themselves. Um, a comment from a reader, whenever I read your post, it's like I'm reading a novel, not just a novel, but an interesting one. Interesting or not, she lives in Florida. She loves spending time with her family and friends, including five kids, two son-in-laws and grandson. Um, please find Melissa Marty on Instagram and Facebook, but you can welcome her today on Open Up. Thank you for joining us and being willing to share your life journey, Melissa. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. And, and we're happy to have you here as well. We, we look especially for women to share on our men's programming. Um, we love all voices and certainly glad to hear yours today. Thank you. Yeah, so um, my whole life has been about learning to love who I am. So it started out, um, my father committed suicide on Father's Day weekend when I was two and a half, and I was kind of the crux of the whole situation. So I grew up with that stigma of feeling like I was unlovable, and that's where it started. It was a very, very young age. Um, my mother went on to marry an abusive man and she was not present. So I had to kind of learn to deal with that. Um, so my entire life has been a process of feeling abandoned, feeling unlovable, feeling unworthy. And I wrote my book, my first one, Beautiful Mess, a few years after my divorce. And I was married for 19 years. Um, beautiful mess kind of came about in a fun way because everybody's like, you should tell your story. And I went on this job interview and this guy says to me, well, your life is kind of a mess. And I was really offended. And I'm like, who are you to tell me my life's mess? But um, 
I realized it really was. And I just needed to kind of hone in and let do the hard work of learning to love who I was and every part about me, even the unlovable parts. When did you come to that realization? At what age, if I, if I could ask? Uh, that I needed to, to do all the self-work? Well, yeah. When did you start this growth journey? 39. <laughs> I was very far in life. I um, Prior to that, you know, I did all of the typical things that somebody that doesn't love themselves does. I looked for validation from outside sources. I was a people pleaser. I was... Um, constantly apologizing for everything all the time, even if it wasn't something that I did, I would accept the responsibility of the other person. Um, and basically just thought that everything bad that happened, I truly deserved that because I wasn't worth having a good life and I wasn't worth, um, what other people were worth. The, um, comparison game, that was a big one for me. I've been there. I understand that one. No matter. Look, I think we all experience some of these things. No matter what, um, there's there's doubts, right? We can. It's. I bet even people on stage, the people we want to emulate, um, mm -hmm. they have issues. They've they've had a lot. They've overcome, and that's really what our show is all about. So maybe take us back um, into your early life and just please give us an idea of what that was like for you. It was very tumultuous. Um, my stepfather was an alcoholic. Um, he struggled um, with anger. Um, so he was very abusive. He was very mean on a daily basis. He would tell me I was fat and ugly and no one would ever love me. And I was four, five, six, seven years of age. I was little. And um, these are words that I ended up having in my head for years. Um, and every once in a while, they still kind of pop up in different situations. Um, and my mother was not present because my father passed away and she was very young and she just kind of escaped and survived. And I learned that when somebody is surviving, they can't be there for you because they're just being there for themselves. And so when you have children and you're just surviving, um, you're not able to give your children the tools they need to actually live and to have life skills that um, make them successful adults. Um, when I was 19 years old, I tried to uh, take my life. It did not work out for me, which was good. Um, that's a whole other story that's in the book. Um, and got on this big spiritual path of finding myself in um, religion and in God, um, which when you put your trust in people, um, you end up getting hurt more. And, you know, um, that's what I did. You know, I looked at other people and I, I put my trust in them rather than in myself and rather than investing in me. You know, I got married when I was 21 to a man that had sex addictions and um, was very unfaithful. And the more unfaithful he got, the angrier he got. And it just kind of bled into every part of my life. Um, so at 39, I divorced and that's when I, the reality light came on, if you will, um, knowing that I couldn't continue on and be successful or be healthy or even really truly live if I didn't face all of the issues that had happened when I was much younger. And it's really hard to face yourself sometimes and um, accept your responsibility in the stunting of your life, you know? Um, and I kind of just came to that point where I had to do that. So I started writing again. Wonderful. And, and you know what, listen, write, writing is therapeutic. And I know you're trying to, you're maybe skipping over some some stuff. And, okay, and what do you nothing, want to know? No, it's just, um, look, we. the one thing I appreciated that you just mentioned is the voices in your head. It's funny how the voices in our head are often those things we hear as children, as, as impressionable as we yes. may be. Um, but the one thing I want to touch on, I did, and I want to point that out for people out there, that, you know, I mean, those voices are in our head or are, are usually come from those we trust, we love, and, and maybe even try to respect. Um, but those voices may not be positive, right? So, so we, those are things we have to overcome in our lives. But the thing I touched on was your mother wasn't there for you at the youngest age. Um, in what way? And then, like, did you have to fend for yourself, like feeding yourself, clothing yourself, or was it emotional support? 
like where what area were you missing in that period of every time? every single area honestly rj um i can remember as far back and most people would probably think this is crazy but i can remember shortly after my father passed and i was two and a half when he did um but we lived in this condo and um i woke up and it was dark and i might have been three three and a half and i went looking for my mother and she i couldn't find her so i opened the front door and i was out wandering in the parking lot because we lived in a condominium at the time and our neighbor found me and took me into their home and was washing my feet when they finally found my mom so it was as far back as that and then it progressed you know when i was five years old we went to the dentist and i had cavities and I thought that if I brushed my teeth, the cavities would go away because no one taught me <laughs> anything. Like no one taught me anything. I didn't learn how to cook. I didn't learn anything. It was all just me. So it started very, very young. Thank you for, for walking through that. I can feel your emotion. I can feel your sadness. Um, you know, that's something that, that people shouldn't have to go through, but unfortunately people do, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, how were you able to manage? How were you able to fend for yourself and get through this if you could? I just, I learned that it, I didn't really count on people. I just counted on myself. Um, I had an older brother and, um, we had different fathers. All of us had different fathers, actually. And so that was very difficult. Um, he was kind of a support to me. He thought he was my protector, <laughs> but um, didn't work out so well a lot of times. I just looked within myself to be there for myself. And um, I didn't have any adults in my life because my mother disappeared. My stepfather was non-existent as far as supporting anything. He was just there to tirade. Um, and my grandmother kind of was a support. I got dropped off there a lot if it was an inconvenience to my mom. But I found that just being me and just looking to myself. I didn't, I didn't have anyone. My grandfather, that was my dad's father, um, couldn't be a part of my life because my siblings wouldn't allow it because they were much older. My dad was 20 years older than my mom. And so his oldest daughter was two weeks younger than my, my mother. So there was a lot of hostility towards me. Um, Eventually, later in life, when I was about 13, my grandfather did become a huge part of my life and apologized for not being there. But up until that age, I struggled with why I was even here, you know, because nobody really seemed to want me. <laughs> you know, my dad died. My mom disappeared. My stepfather berated me. You know, it was just kind of a question, like, why was I even born? Like, I didn't ask to be here. So, so that was a big struggle. I mean, even at a very, very young age, you know, you wonder because you don't have that safety and you don't have that security. And we all have to have that, especially in those young, young years. So I grew up with a lot of mistrust. I grew up with a lot of self-hate, um, a lot of self-hate. Um, I was probably one of the most successful students you would ever meet. Um, but it wasn't ever enough for me because I just couldn't get to that place of believing that I really was worthy. Mm -hmm. So again, you, that's another thing too, is, is the school age, the school years um, where we need companionship, we need friendship, um, but in a reserved person, somebody who's like you say, you've come to rely on yourself and not be open to other people. How, how did you manage? Did you have friends? Did you have uh, a, a good social time? So we moved a lot. Um, because of the abuse, you know, I'd come home and there'd be a semi in the driveway with all of our stuff being loaded onto it. Um, so I went to 10 elementary schools. I didn't have the opportunity to build those really foundational friendships. You know, I was there long enough to just kind of let people just get a glimpse of who I was. So it was easy because I could kind of be whatever I wanted to be at the new school. If I wanted to be outgoing, I could be, if I wanted to keep to myself, I could be, um, so I kind of 
was able to like not reinvent myself, but, you know, just be what I wanted to be because I knew I wasn't going to be there long enough for anyone to really know me. Um, junior high, I was the same school the entire junior high year, but I went to six high schools. So it was um, very um, nomadic, <laughs> you know, like um, um, gypsy like. So, but I did well in school. I, I graduated in the, I was the eighth out of 865 students. So I was not, um, that was kind of what I did. I poured myself into my studies. Sure. Because there's little out there beyond, beyond um, yourself, I guess is, is the way it goes. Right. Right. Wow. Um, you're, you're bringing up, you know, some, some hardships that, you know, we don't, or at least the general population may not see right these are things right. that are hidden um especially look aside from the, the the voices that we hear what about yourself what were you telling yourself at this period of time what was it like i hated myself i didn't like anything i wasn't um i wasn't smart enough i wasn't thin enough i wasn't pretty enough i wasn't kind enough i wasn't um i was never enough and when you don't believe in yourself and when you don't believe you're enough and you don't believe you're lovable, nobody else can truly come in and be that, you know, they can't love you because you don't love yourself. You put out there that you're not lovable. That's what you're, you are really going to get that back. And um, I saw that pattern of me reaching for people to fill me up and you can't do that. <laughs> you have to be able to fill yourself. You have to be able to, um, love who you are. And I didn't, I didn't, I, I literally, I feel like I scratched and clawed my whole life through life just to get to the point of, you know, being normal. Um, when I got married, um, I felt like things were going to change. I was 21. Um, I had been in college, um, and was really hopeful. And then probably about six months, no, about a year and a half into the marriage was the first affair. And that just devastated me because I thought that I had finally like reached this point in my life where somebody actually could love me and I was going to have a good life and I was going to have all the things I dreamed of. And that just came crashing down. So then you start questioning yourself again and then those voices come back and then you're back in that whole pattern and that rut of um do i really have any worth and is anybody ever going to see that am i the only person that's going to ever believe in me so those are the things that they just they keep coming around until you can look to yourself for the validation and i say that a lot but it's really true like when i became single again after being married, my friends were like, you just really need to spend time with yourself. You need to love yourself. And I'm like, I was kind of angry at first. And I'm like, well, who are you to tell me I don't love myself? But when I really stepped back and I really looked at it, RJ, I realized I never really did love myself ever. Like I was always trying to be what everybody else wanted me to be. I was always trying to do the things that would gain somebody's affection or their acceptance or whatever. I never truly stayed true to who I wanted to be. I gave up my writing. I started writing at five, but I gave it up. And um, I did that in hopes of getting something better in return. And I ended up getting something worse. So it's something that I really am passionate about letting people know you have to find within yourself who you are and know who you are and love who you are and be unapologetic about who you are. Um, unapologetic. I mean, even if you have things about you don't, you don't like, it's still you and it makes you who you are and nobody else can be you. So that was the biggest transition for me. And so I love the way you always put a positive spin on all my questions. Um, even though we're talking about, you know, the hardships and negative issues. Um, but so let me ask you a yes or no question. Do you love yourself now? I do. Good. I do. Glad to hear I do. It. Because the journey is is crazy. Um, look, like you said, you started what you thought was going to be a loving, trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. um, turned out very short time to be a you know a, a bad situation. 
what made you stay to 19 years after you know 18 months and it turned turned to crap so what made you stay um all that time i am stubborn <laughs> i was going to make the life that i wanted and i loved him and i thought that he needed somebody to love him and that he didn't know love and i stayed to prove my love it sounds ridiculous um but i did um we had five children and they're beautiful and wonderful and i wouldn't do it any other way um other than maybe they wouldn't have gotten so hurt in a lot of it um i'm stubborn and I, I believe in love. I do, even though I didn't love myself. I believe in the power of love. I believe that when you can accept somebody for who they are and love them unapologetically, you know, we all have faults. We all walk through stuff. None of us are perfect. And um, I wanted to be for somebody else. <laughs> this is it. I wanted to be for somebody else what I needed to be for myself. Um, and uh, that was a life lesson for me. Everything that I was to everybody else is what I was looking for, if that makes any sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. Totally feel it. Um, because again, you know, you're taking the words, the questions right out of my mouth. Um, but again, because I mean, were you, basically that's what I'm asking is, were you looking for love? And did, 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 did he provide that for you? Um, he did to the best of his ability. I mean, I'm not upset with my um, former husband at all. Um, he really did need love. He came from a very broken home as well. And I think when you get two broken people together, it's very hard for that to succeed, even if you do love each other, you know. Um, and I was one of those um, optimistic, romantic people that was like, well, love covers everything. It covers every sin. If you love somebody, you can make it through. And that's not necessarily true. You can love somebody and still not be with them because they are not healthy for you. And that was a huge lesson for me um, to be able to love somebody and not feel like they had to be a part of my life um, or to uh, speak into my life. You know, um, he did love me. I, I will say that. I just know that he had a lot of things that he needed to work on as well. And those things were pretty detrimental to my mental health. <laughs> so um, as a matter of fact, um, not to be too personal, but on our last conversation together, um, as we were separating, um, I said, you know, I love you, but you will spend your entire life trying to prove to me that you're not lying and I'll spend the rest of it thinking you are. And I said, and that's not healthy for either one of us. So that's kind of where I left it. And um, you just have to come to a point where you realize that you have to go and heal and they need to go do whatever is best for them. If they want to heal, then they'll heal. If they don't want to heal, then they won't. They'll keep doing what they do. But that's not your responsibility. So, uh, absolutely. Um, I I love a quote from John Maxwell. I don't know how far you are in your personal journey. He was he was the guy who changed my life. Was John Maxwell? He, I read a book called Make Today Count, and mm -hmm. at that time, that's what I needed. Um, so and it changed my life. But he talks about um, his wife was asked one time at a seminar, um, does does he make you happy? And he was stunned by the answer because her answer was, well, no but it's not her, it's not his place to make me happy, right? Because we have to be happy ourselves. And it, sometimes we go looking to other people for that happiness and, and we can't right. find it because we need to find it within ourselves. So thank you for this, because I love where this conversation is going. As much as you are a woman, we're getting your side of the story. Um, this is, there's so many similarities for people out there. Men and women could be going through much similar things that you're going through. So thank you for being so open in your journey today. Oh, you're welcome. I think that, you know, a lot of us put our happiness into another person and we really can't. It's not fair to them, actually. Um, it's not fair to us and it's not fair to them because they can't be our everything. And that was I think I put a lot on the people that I became in relationships with because I needed from them. Um, I didn't want to be needy. I wanted to be this strong person, you know, like I got this together, blah, blah, blah. But deep down, I needed their validation and i needed their acceptance and i needed their words to make me feel whole and that was very very unhealthy um 
And it wasn't fair to them because if they were having an off day, then I would get off because I was responding and reacting rather than just being me and being steady and true. And when you know yourself and when you love yourself and when you can within yourself be happy and be whole and be complete, then you can come together with somebody else and you can both have a bad day and it doesn't become this huge ordeal because you're not looking to them to fix anything in you. Um, so. No, perfect. that's awesome. But so now we get into you getting past that again, you're now 39 years old. You realize I need to do some work on myself. Um, mm -hmm. What was that journey like again? you. So I know for myself, I started writing to change my life. It, it was therapeutic for me. It started to get the information out. Um, talk about what life was like for this, you at this point where you have to change your life. So single mom of five, that's huge. Um, <laughs> I went back to college, worked my way through college, um, was writing the entire time. Um, it was hard because I didn't date for like four years after I got divorced because I'm like, <laughs> I need so much work. I wasn't going to put anybody through anything like that. So it was hard. It was lonely. I, I'm not going to say it wasn't. And um, I met somebody actually, and that totally fell apart. But I was healthy enough that when it fell apart, I didn't take the ownership of it. And I didn't, I didn't um, collapse or break down or hate myself or think that it had anything really to do with me per se, because it honestly didn't, it was, um, whole nother, whole nother issue in and of itself. Um, so writing the book is very cathartic for me. My first book came out in 2020 and it was, it, it did really well. It's called beautiful mess. And, um, it is the journey to loving myself and it gives you kind of a memoir of my life. Um, and then I moved to, to Florida a few years after, well, no, actually the year that it came out, I moved down here and found that if I wasn't careful, I could find myself in the same pattern and picking the same types of relationships where um, I was trying to fix or trying to um, be around for somebody or find my worth in them. And so I wrote Reset because Reset is about... Um, facing yourself and loving yourself through your problems and loving yourself enough to change your patterns because it's an internal thing. Um, and we tend to gravitate towards what we know, even though it's not healthy because it's safe and you know, you know, it, it's familiar and it's a lot harder to move yourself out of that. Um, and so that's what reset is about. Uh, and so and so by the sounds of it, you are in a better place at this time. Yes. Yes. I'm in a better place. Yes. I am doing much better. I love my life. I love where it's going. Um, obviously, there's still a lot of things to work on because it's funny when in, in the self acknowledgement and self knowledge, you realize how much you need to work on, but it's not like a a detriment and it's not like an indictment against you. You're just like, Oh no, this, I, I could improve in this area and I could look at things different and I can have a different perspective. And so the more you know yourself, the more you want to know yourself, if that makes any sense. And you mm -hmm. want to find out what makes you tick and why did you react in that way? And how could you have responded better? Um, so I love that there. by the way. We know where we're <laughs> By the way, that's a therapeutic. Oh, I was going to say, Sivan wanted to know where to find your book. I guess he found it because um, he did <laughs> post out there for people to, to get your book. Um, so that's great. Um, and uh, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> therapeutic. Nope, I've, I've still lost it, my thought. Not a big deal. Um, we got people to, to connect with your book. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to... Um, do some quick announcements sure. and then I'm going to um, I'm going to come back and ask you a couple of questions. Okay. So just bear with me. Thank you folks. Um, we have several live shows here in voice of men 360. The first, which you're participating in right now is called open up where we share people's life journey with you. Um, this is a live talk show recorded Sunday mornings at 10 AM 
Eastern time. So please look out for more than that, for more of that. Uh, we also have the same thing in Tamil language, which is called Vili, which means I, um, Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. Eastern time. And again, with these two shows, we invite people out to share their personal life journey with you. We also host a special show the first Saturday of every month. Um, we host a webinar called, or and sorry, we don't have a name for it, but uh, we bring out the expertise of organizations to discuss a topic of interest to them and, of course, of interest to our community of men. We also host a special show called The Unspoken Tears. This one's the second Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The focus of this show is domestic violence against men bullying, male sexual abuse, traumas, porn addiction, human trafficking, and more. These are tough topics, and we discuss them here in Voice of Men 360. We also like to highlight authors. So we bring out individuals to contribute to the who contribute to the well-being of men and boys through writing articles, media topics, and we recognize and appreciate them. This is called Author Circle, and we host that the third Saturday of every month from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And then we turn all of our content into podcast episodes. So please look out for us on all of your favorite platforms, iPhone, Google Play, Spotify, and more. We host something I'm very proud of, which is a monthly men's group. Um, it's actually bi-weekly men's group. Um, but this one is only for men by men. Um, there are no recordings. We want this to be an open space to men, for men to come out and share their issues and discuss them in order to relieve that tension or stress that comes along with not talking. Um, so this one I'm very proud of is called the Open Ups Men's Peer Group. That's the every Tuesday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., 7.30 p.m., sorry. Um, and the next one will be September 6th. So please come out and join us for that one. We're also looking to reinstitute an Indigenous peer-to-peer -peer support group. So if you're an Indigenous person and you'd like to be involved, um, we call this one Pass the Talking Stick. So we're very excited to try and get that one up and running again for our Indigenous peoples. There are no limitations, once again, with gender, age, nationality, or ethnic groups. All walks of life are invited to participate in our programming. If you want to be a guest on any of our shows whether and, and help us, whether indirectly or directly, please reach out to us. We're looking to work with individuals, professionals, government organizations, community um, groups, associations, businesses, and more. Please reach out to us. Our phone number is 437-889-8329. Our email, info at voiceofmen360.org, which makes our website www.voiceofmen360.org. You can find us on all of your favorite social media platforms, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe here on YouTube. And you visit our Facebook group. We're looking to increase the voice and share the awareness. Um, we're looking to reach 5,000 members by the end of this year. So please Join us, facebook.com slash groups slash Voice of Men 360, and share our content there so people can we can reach out and help more people and continue the amazing work we're doing. Thank you for your support. Um, and now back to Melissa. Melissa, there's two questions I like to ask to end the show. Um, the first is, what can we do um, or what can our young people do um, to help their empower their own journey? Um, find somebody to support you in your growth. You have to be the one to, to do the work, but, um, finding a safe place to, to grow and to express yourself is key. Um, and I think that there's a lot more things that are offered now than when we were kids, RJ. Um, but be deliberate and be intentional in loving yourself. And I um, always say, you know, write out all of the things that you like about yourself and then even write out the things you don't like about yourself and then look at that and be objective about it. Um, and because some of the things you don't like about yourself are really trivial, you know, they, they don't matter. Um, but we focus on those because it's easier to focus on what we don't like than what we do. So that's why I always say write them both out, you know, um, but it is key to have a good support system. And I didn't have that. Um, it was, I was too transient moving around, but, um, if you can find somebody that you can, um, get support from, 
that will encourage and, you to keep going. And even if you're like a vagabond life, you know what I mean? You could still <laughs> find those people out there. You can find, you know, p pastors or, or, you yeah. know, maybe a community organization where, where they have mentors and leaders that are, that are very active and, and want to help people like yourself who are struggling and, and, um, so uh, we're actually going to have two more questions because it looks like we got a question from the audience. The first one was, um, how long did it take to write your book? The first one took me um, a total of, I would say, about nine months. Um, I was uh, very intent on getting out all of the struggles that I had. And so I would wake up whenever a thought would come, I would write it out. Um, and it took me about nine months. Now, getting it all published and getting it out for sale took probably about another nine months. So in total, it was about a year and a half from birthing to um, being out for people to see. And that is, that is, that is close to standard. You know what? So, so again, if you people out there have, have the interest of writing their story, I like what you said. I believe in it too, you know, writing down all your thoughts and then compounding on those thoughts, right? Expanding mm -hmm. on them so that again, it does eventually but become some piece of content, whether you get to writing a book or not, it is some piece of content that others can receive value from. Right. So thank you for that. I'm sure that was a value to to the person who asked it. So um, again, start writing, start putting it down on paper and you never know what might become of it. So the last question I like to ask is, what can we do as a society to help people on this journey? I think more than anything is to be more accepting and be more available. I think that one of the biggest challenges in our society today is we're all so busy and we don't take the time to really see what other people might be going through around us and being sensitive to that. Instead, we get irritated by somebody not following through or, you know, something happening. And rather than giving somebody grace and saying there has to be a reason that, that they are acting this way or responding this way, we tend to get on the defensive. So I would say as a society, we need to be more accepting. We need to be more encouraging. We need to be more supportive of people in their own journey because everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has something they've walked through or are currently walking through, and we just don't know what it is. Absolutely. Being more open, being more supportive, um, and giving them a safe space to walk yep. that journey, I think is our biggest struggle. But it's I'm so glad you mentioned it because, again, we, we need to be there for our other people. Yep. Thank you. Your journey and you, the way you tell it, you're definitely interesting story and the way you deliver it was very wonderful. So thank you for being our guest today on our show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So then we'd like to make sure you're coming on our show. How can we connect people back to you? So I have um, a website. It's missymartai.com, M-I-S-S-Y-M-A-R-T-I.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Melissa M. Martai. Um, and then Facebook as well, mostly M. Marti. So you can find me any one of those ways. Melissa, thank you for coming up and being open and sharing your life journey with us today. Thank you. And so that's me. That's our show. And this is me, RJ Horner, asking you until next time, please open up.